Welcome back. In this video we're going to expand our discussion about subgroups and we're going to talk about how we test for them. Um, but kind of as a subtext for this video, we'll be, we'll be proving a few things, um, a few equivalent subgroup tests. The actual content of the tests themselves are perhaps not the most fascinating things in the world, but they're really good exercises for getting used to doing some relatively basic proofs. So that's, that's kind of the underlying focus of this class, even though it's kind of about testing for subgroups. So it's a bit of both. Be, thinking, be trying to think quite critically about how we're proving these statements in as much as we're thinking about the statements themselves. Okay, so here is our first theorem, and it's called the one-step subgroup test. So the statement of the theorem is as follows. Let G be a group and H a non-empty subset of G. If AB inverse is a member of H whenever A and B are members of H, then it follows that H is a subgroup of G. Our job is to first wrap our heads around what this is saying, and second to prove this thing. So we'll optimistically write proof down here, because we expect to be able to prove one of those, uh, produce one of those. But first we've got to understand what's happening with it. Right, so we've been given a group G, so all the rules of groups apply to that group, and we've been given a non-empty subset of G. Okay, it's non-empty, so that means we can assume there's something in it, but we have no other information at all. So if we were to build up a little bit of a picture of what we have to work with, at the moment our subset H has something in it. We don't know anything about what exactly it is, but it has at least one thing, and maybe some more things, maybe not. Remember, um, the trivial subgroup, which is just that entity, will fall under this definition as well, so that might be all we've got. But at the moment, the thing we've been given is a non-empty subset of G. And we've been given a condition that applies to members of H. And hopefully, with that information, we can establish that H is in fact a subgroup. Okay, so... Given that we've got this set H with an element H in it that we know nothing else about, this rule here that I've just highlighted, the second one, if AB inverse is an H whenever AB is an H, this must apply to this element H. Okay, so rule must apply to our H there. To H, no matter what it is. So I'm going to put H in for both A and B. So put H or A equals H and B equals H. So therefore I get H times H inverse must be a member of H, and that just equals the identity. Okay, so that's cool. So because this rule must apply, we've actually shown that the identity must be a member of our subgroups. That's a really good thing. So that's the first thing we need to show. Um, so if we go back to our proof, we'll say first we show that the identity is a member of H. So H is a non-empty subset, so let H be a member of H. We're justified in doing this because H is non-empty. Then applying A equals H and B equals H, we see AB inverse equals H, H inverse equals the identity is a member of H. Okay, so that's good. So we've shown that the, ident that the identity is in fact a member of H. Now let's just remember back to what it is we have to show. To show H is a subgroup, it should be closed under the group operation. So if I take two members of H and multiply them together, I should get something else in H. And it also needs to, if I have an inverse um, of an element, it also must be an H if H is an H. Okay, there's a lot of H's in one sentence, so maybe we'll just sketch up what we mean. So our picture of what H is now is a little different. This is what it was. Now we know the identity is in there. Again, we don't know if there's anything else. It might be the only element, um, but we know we have the identity to make use of. Okay, let's suppose that there's some other element H here. Uh, if we want to show that H inverse is also in our set, then we can go A, again we'll use the rule, this time we'll put an A equals E and B equals H. And then AB inverse will equal E 
times h inverse, which will be h inverse. So that means that if I if I put b equals h in, this guarantees for me that h the, the rule that we've been given guarantees for me that h inverse will also be in the set. So that's how we that's how we get closure of under inverses here. Um, we say um, now let h be a member of h. Oh no, we've already got that. We'll use the same h as before. Um, now with let a equals the identity, we now have that, and b equals h. Okay, so b is just an arbitrary element of our set now, which could be the identity, it could, it could be something else. Then a b inverse equals a, sorry, e h inverse equals h inverse must be a member of h. So if h is a member of our capital H, then it follows that its inverse must also be a member. And this doesn't preclude the set just being the identity because that could be the h that we took in our, in our thing there. Okay, so we've done closure under inverses. Um, we just need to now do closure under the group operation. So now we need to show under group operation. Um, so we'll say let G and H be members of H. We want to show that G H is a member of H also. Again, we now know that if our set contains an H, then it also contains an H inverse. We've shown that. So we're again going to be a little bit creative with the rule. We've got a, b inverse, and it's just going to be the right choices of a and b to get us g, h. So I'm going to stick g into a, and I'm going to stick h inverse into b. Because when I take the inverse of that, I'll get back to h again, and so I'll get the g, h that I want. So choose a equals g and b equals h inverse, then it follows that a b inverse is equal to g h inverse inverse equals g h, which is a member of h by the rule that we've been given in the theorem statement. Okay, so we've got that entity, we've got inverses, we've got um, closure, a binary operation property, and associativity comes for free, um, so actually we've established now that H is a subgroup of G if these rules apply. So hence, H is a subgroup of G as required. Okay, now a quick note on how to use this. We'll have some examples of testing for subgroups in a subsequent, in the next video after this one. But just a quick note on what you actually do. So to, to use the test, so we've proven that the test works, that's what we've done so far. But to use the thing, first show that the identity is an H. Okay, that shows non-empty. Okay, that's to satisfy the non-empty subset part. I mean, you could show that some other member of H, that the set was not non-empty some other way, but usually the way to do it is just to show that the identity is in it. Then show that a b inverse is an h for all a b and h okay so you then take an arbitrary element a and b from your set and show that it follows that the a b inverse must be in it and if it is then your set h is a subgroup which is what you're after in fact let's do a quick example let's just take um make some space uh, example i'm sure we can fit it in here So we'll say, let's show that this set here, the even numbers between 0 and 10, so 2k mod 10 for integer k's. Okay, so this is the set <coughs> pardon me, 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8 is a subgroup of z10.
Okay, so first off, first thing, we have zero is a member of S, so S is non-empty. Okay, the point of this is we cannot actually use the subgroup test until we've established that our subset is non-empty. It kind of obviously is because we've written it down explicitly here, but sometimes it'll be a little more subtle than that. But let's just get into the habit of doing this anyway. So our subset is non-empty. Now, um, let A, B be members of S, which means that A equals 2S and B equals 2T for some... st, some integers st, and z, running out of space again, then ab inverse, again we're in additive notation now, so ab inverse is a minus b, is equal to 2s minus 2t, which is equal to 2, this is mod 10, which is 2s minus t, mod 10, and that fits into our definition of S, which is a member of S as required. Okay, we've shown that A minus B is an even number, mod 10, and that's the definition of the set, just here, and so we have shown that it's a subgroup. So the two things we have to do, first off, show the identity as a member of the set. It's kind of step zero of the one step subgroup test, if you like, um, and then just do the AB inverse or A minus B calculation and show that you get a member of the set back. Okay, so our next theorem is the so-called two-step subgroup test, and it's actually very similar to the last one, where we have a group G and again a non-empty subset of G. This time we're just doing it in two steps. We're showing closure, okay, if AB is an H whenever an A and B are an H, and inverses, i.e. A inverse is an H whenever A is an H, separately rather than trying to do it in one hit like we did last time. Then H is a subgroup of G. Okay, I'm just going to really quickly show you how to prove this without really going into great detail because we've done all the heavy lifting of the proof in the previous one. So this one comes out nice and quickly. Okay, so we need to show that if, well, we don't need, this is one way of doing it, that if A, B are an H, it follows... that A, B inverse is an H. Because if we can do that, if we can take two elements A and B and show that A, B inverse is a member of H, then we can just say it's a subgroup by the one-step subgroup test and just be done with it. So, B inverse is a member of H by closure under inverses. Okay, so closure under inverses has been given to us explicitly here. That's this, uh, sorry, this section here. Just remove that line, that shouldn't be there. Okay, so we've been given that. A, if A, B are members of H, then we've been given that B inverse is going to be an H. And we've also been given, and hence, A, B inverse is a member of H. Because now that B inverse is an H also, we can just use the other rule here to assert that AB inverse must be an H2. By closure under multiplication. Therefore, H is a subgroup of G by the one step test. Okay, so it's, again, it's not, it's almost exactly the same thing as we did before. It's just sometimes it's more convenient to check closure and inverses separately, and so you can do that if you like. The kind of neat thing is that we could use our proof of the one-step subgroup test um, to prove the two-step one as well. And for our last theorem, our last subgroup test, is the so-called finite subgroup test. Now, just remember those theorem numbers, they correspond to the theorems from the textbook by Galleon. So this one says that if I have a non-empty sub set, not some group. If H is a non-empty subset of a group G, all we need, and it should be a finite group, let's just fix that, a non-empty finite subset, there we go, that's all we need to know. Okay, a non-empty finite subset of a group G, then if H is closed under the group operation of G, 
then H is less than or equal to G, i.e. H is a subgroup of G. Okay, so actually if we have a finite group, there's not very much to test. All we have to show is that it's closed under the group operation, and that will give us that H is a subgroup. Well, at least it will once we've proven this thing. So we still have to do the hard work of actually proving this theorem. Once we've proven it, then we can just go ahead and use it. Um, so all we have to check is closure, uh, and this theorem is suggesting that inverses kind of comes for free. So we only have to worry about one half of the two-step subgroup test here. Okay, so we need to show that if A is in our subset, then so too is A inverse. Because if we do that, then we'll have a subgroup by the, the two-step subgroup test, because the first test, the other step is given to us in the actual theorem statement itself. Okay, so we'll start by choosing ourselves an element of our subset. Okay, it's non-empty, so we can do that. Okay, if A is equal to... We're done. Okay, we know that the inverse of the identity is in our subset, so we don't need to worry any further about that. But if A is not the identity, otherwise, we need to somehow figure out that A inverse is in our set based on this. Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to take A, and we're going to start taking powers of A and see what happens. Okay, so... By closure under the group operation, which is given to us as part of the statement, all of these things that I'm building here should be part of my subset H. Okay, so I can keep taking powers, but the other key piece of information in our theorem statement is that it's a finite subset. Okay, so my set H has some kind of finite limit. So what that means is I can't just keep adding new powers indefinitely. Eventually I'm going to come back to something I've seen before. So the way I've stated this, we presumably will come back to A, but maybe something weird happens, so we'll be as general as we can, and we'll say at some point this must repeat itself because we cannot have infinitely many terms. So the way we can say that is there exist uh, integers i and j, so there are integers i and j, okay, positive ones, so again I'll use the natural numbers for that, um, such that a to the i equals a to the j. Okay, we may as well have j being greater than i. Okay, no loss in generality in doing that. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of the key observation here, and we're going to try and make use of that fact to try and pull out our inverse. Okay, so a to the i is equal to a to the j. I can also write this as follows, a to the i a to the j minus i is equal to a to the j. Which is also in turn equal to a to the i. So what we see here, if we just kind of ignore this part of it for a second, the a to the i times this thing is equal to a to the i. So that must be our identity. Okay, and since... Sorry, we can take that out, so let's just write that as a separate statement. a to the j minus i is equal to the identity. So this is useful. So remember the picture we've got in here is a times a times a times a j minus i times is equal to e. So really, this thing here is going to be a inverse because it's a times that is going to be the identity. We just need to be a little bit careful that we don't mess up because if j minus i is only 1, and this won't work. So is it possible that j minus i equals 1? Is that possible? Well, if that were the case, then a to the 1 would be the identity. But actually, we've assumed that a is not equal to the identity because we've already got rid of that case. So we can assume that j minus i, I is greater than 1. And hence, this piece here is a to the j minus i minus 1 times a is going to be the identity. So that'll be the inverse we're after. Okay, so we've made a whole lot of messy scribble, but we've kind of got our head around the idea we're after. 
We've got rid of the identity case and we can see why we did that now um, to make sure that j minus i would be big enough. So otherwise, let's just see if we can summarize what we've written in a nice sort of way. Um, otherwise, there exist. So we'll get our statement, there exists integers, there exists i, j, and n with j greater than i such that a to the i equals a to the j because h is finite. Okay, that's that part. Therefore, a to the i, a to the j minus i, just by standard laws of exponentiation, is equal to a to the j, but that also equals a to the i, and therefore, by this equation here, Thus, a to the j minus i is, in fact, the identity. If j minus i equals 1, then a to the j minus, then a equals e. Which we have already excluded. Thus, j minus i is greater than or equal to 2, and hence a times a to the j minus i minus 1 is something we can write down, and thus a to the j minus i minus 1 equals a inverse. Okay, so Let's just summarize what we've actually done here. We used the closure under the group operation to establish that all those powers of A are in our set. Okay, um, and we couldn't go backwards because we didn't yet know whether inverses were in the set or not. Okay, so we couldn't have gone backwards. We could only look at the positive powers and use the group closure to get that sequence. That's why we had to go through this slightly hoop jumping exercise to make this work. We then appeal to the finiteness of the set to show that there were two numbers. Eventually we must repeat ourselves somehow. And then we just again jump through a few more hoops to figure out that j minus i, the difference between those two exponents, is essentially the identity, or a to the power of that number is the identity. And finally, we just said, okay, now that we've got a to the power of something as the identity, we just took one of those a's out the front and showed that the rest of that must in fact be the inverse of a. Cool, and now that we've shown the inverses in the set, we've got closure under the operation already as part of the statement, and therefore our set H is a subgroup of G. Okay, so those are our three subgroup tests. In practice, you'll be using whichever one you feel like, uh, and we'll explore some examples of these in the next video. But I think we've gone on long enough, so we'll catch you next time.